start of the session. I'm sorry if I want to use their name. Uh, okay. Uh, it's Joseph Gordas. Uh, he is a physicist with a BSc with honors from the University of Manchester, UK, and also has a PhD in paper physics from the University of Manchester Institute of Science and Technology. Uh, he studied natural research science at the University of Rhode Island and joined the Penn Soil Science Faculty at UVM in 2008. His talk is entitled Amidness Antiporcus, Invasive Asiatic Earthworms in New England and Reasons to Monitor, monitor Vigilante. All right, so there you are. Thank you very much. Right, so uh, my job this morning, well, this afternoon already, time flies. Uh, so my job is to introduce it to a species of earthworm that you probably have seen, but you didn't know what to do with it. It's a new invader to our forests, uh, it's, it's found in many, many places, you probably have seen it. Uh, it's called Amythus, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's the genus, Amythus agrestis is the one that you find mostly here in, in Vermont now. And the reason why this is so important is because it, it changes how forests work. So it has a, a, has a systematic uh, effect on forests. And I already mentioned that, you know, I suspect there's more, more erosion happening. There is actually a tie into uh, toxic uh, heavy metals that these are, bi are bioaccumulating and maybe even um, remobilizing from the forest floor that this particular species has more mercury in it than the habitat um, from where it's feeding. So it, it biologically accumulates incredibly. So a Memphis aggressive and antipotas, watch out for it. Um, buttons, okay. It's not your grandfather's or not your father's or mother's um, that's one. That's for sure. So you wonder how many species of earthworms there are here in Vermont, 18 um, of which 14 are of European origin and four of them are uh, Asian. There's three species of Amethyst. Um, two of them were just recognized recently, the next last uh, three months. Amethyst aggressus is, is the most common one that we think is here. It's called, known as the crazy snake worm. And you can probably guess why that is. It wiggles around like a snake, moves like a snake. This is a snake. It's actually found its way into herpetology uh, uh, collections in Asia because it moves like a snake. It is a snake, right? Um, how do you recognize this particular earthworm? Well, uh, so that is a Memphis aggressus. Uh, two, two images of it. Um, one thing is you look for is, is these these castings. They have which is carpets of castings on the forest floor. They can be two to four inches deep, uh, and they are I think highly erodible particles. Um, the earthworm is about 48 inches long. It's dark on the top. But what really gives it away is this, this light, smooth ring around the collar, also known as the fetellum. And it goes all the way around that, that worm. And that's what gives it away. This is, this is what, what these, <coughs> these Amethyst uh, species look like. They have a fetellum that is annular. It goes all the way around. It's a very, very active earthworm. Moves like a snake, as I said. It loses its tail, just like a salamander, when you, when you uh, touch it the wrong way. You cannot miss this. If you see it, you know it. You know what it is. It's pathogenic, uh, no sex piece. Uh, one of these worms can found a population. Where do we see it in Vermont? So I give you a little bit of a background where you might want to look. Uh, if you really want to <laughs> do admit this tourism, uh, down here, Upper Valley, around uh, Norwich and Hanover, lots and lots of them. Burlington area, of course, also really highly populated. Um, as, you, as you go further out into the, in, into the wilds of Vermont, you see fewer of them. Uh, woodlands, nurseries, gardens, compost piles, that's where they hang out. And uh, I did a, so that, those, these are my data. I uh, also did a, a survey of master gardeners in Vermont and New Hampshire and Connecticut. And uh, we basically just figured out which which counties there were in. So the upper three up there, Orleans, Essex, and Coast County, um, were were free of this, or at least they weren't reported there by master gardeners. But otherwise, they're everywhere. 
and this is a new species, so 20 years maybe that they've been here. Uh, if you look at, at the data, how, you know, look at how many respondents to these surveys had seen them, about 20% in both Vermont and New Hampshire, 90% in Connecticut, 90% of master gardens responded to saw them. Um, what's the net effect of this worm on, on, on vegetation? So, you know what worms? Right there, so they do exist as places, uh, but you have to put higher elevations. Earthworms. And this is actually the site that, that is where the, you only find the Memphis. So the Memphis is incredibly aggressive and a really good competitor for, for space. And so all the European species that were in there have been displaced. Not that that's a bad thing. One of my friends who wants to control earthworms in Portland says, well, why don't we just dump some Memphis there, wait five years, and then we have to deal with one species rather than with five or six species. <laughs> Good luck with that, I guess. Um, but the main thing is, in these forests, you don't see any more regeneration. 100 years from now, my prediction is no more maple syrup. It's all Aunt Jemima, and that's really shocking. Uh, your children will not like it. How did they get here? So what's the chain of events that got, got them here? Uh, there's your, there's your, uh, yeah. The first settlers coming in, soil was the ballast in these boats. They dumped the soil. Soil contained either the worms themselves or their cocoons. And that was the beginning of the invasion. And it's still world trade that, that drives these invasions. Just like any other uh, invasive species comes from overseas, um, horticulture is, is really where it's at. Uh, but you know, why do we have this invasion here? So it has to do with the last glaciation. It basically killed, killed off most of the earthworms. All of the earthworms in, in this earthworm free zone up here north of the last glaciation uh, have gone. You get, you get earthworm invaders, they find a niche, they expand. Um, and it doesn't mean to say that they're not in the southern parts here. You know, it's the same, same thing. They, there's the invasions of, of these earthworms there too. Very aggressive. So they even uh, displace some of the southern earthworm species from there. Um, from their habitat. So, how did they move after the, after the first invasion? So, vermicomposting, people move things around. You wouldn't believe how ignorant worm producers are. So, one story I can tell you is I went to Worm Day in, at the University of Connecticut. I presented my stuff, and then the, the lady <coughs> organizer said, Oh, let me have a look at my red wiggles. It was all periodic excavators, an Asian species, totally different from the red wigglers, highly invasive in, in warmer climes. 100%. And somebody saw these as red wigglers. The bait trade, horticulture. Horticulture trade, you see, it's, it's a global trade. You know, everything goes from one place to another. It's pretty crazy. Um, so back to back to our, my master gardeners and so ask you know where do you see them? If you see them, where do you see them? So mulch beds, mulch, you feed these earthworms. That's that's what even woody mulches they immediately have, have breaking the wood down and and uh, you know raising you out of money because you have to put stuff back six months later. Uh, garden on forest properties they have a wide range of habitats that they can survive in, and lots of them are um, in horticultural settings. Uh, we started off, you know, after the after the Ice Age, uh, forest developed and developed a really thick organic layer that's that's a, a germination medium uh, and seed bank for most of the, the plants in the forest. Um, so that is going. You, you get uh, this more type forest floor with, with a very loose um, mat of, of roots and fungi embedded in organic matter to this very de much denser um, mineral soil, a, a horizon, that's been worked by the worms. Again, that, this is the net, the net effect. There is some, there is some uh, correlation, that there is some interaction between uh, these earthworms and deer grazing. So the earthworms <coughs> take care of the forest floor. Deer comes in and says, hey, where's my food? And they start feeding on saplings, with saplings, and so forest regeneration goes down. Um, for those of you who are actually monitoring, uh, there is a, a rapid assessment tool, RAT. 
invasive earth home rapid assessment tool where you look at the soil surface and you can you can classify um, you can classify the damage done into five classes based on what the overrising looks like, the organic layer in the soil looks like, uh, whether you find fine roots and fungi in, in the top part of the soil, on the type of castings, and then of course you know what kind of platforms are present. Um, and in this heavy category, um, you have a vast change in that, that forest ecosystem that will, uh, will not only change plant, the plant composition, but will also change, uh, change how, how that forest ecosystem is interacting with streams and so on. Um, when do you have to look if you want to find them? The best time to find them is just at the beginning, right here in Vermont, just around the beginning of, of uh, July. Uh, that's when they become uh, mature, so then that's when you can see that to tell it, so it makes it easier to, to uh, see. Most of the time, even if, if you don't see the tellum, if you put me in your hand and they flap about, that's what they are. That's, that's an infus investus and cobalt. Uh, if you see them, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, tell me where you saw them, uh, what setting they were in, how many did you see, whether well, that's a lot or just a few. Um, and how large were those ones? So thank you very much. Time for a few questions. Sure. Um, but for those, thank you so much for this presentation. I, uh, every it was time, a pleasure. <laughs> it was definitely a pleasure. Um, every time I hear the word invasion, uh, especially among the uh, biodiversity species, I always think about the logical feedback. You throw in a few organisms. So we talked about fungi, we talked about uh, grazing, obviously there are some organisms that are being uh, eaten, um, grass, or, uh, and also you mentioned deer. So have you looked at the large, a larger spectrum of species and analyzed the network of, of these organisms and how they interact and see maybe you can get them? Also? I would love to. Uh, the problem with earthworms is they're not really fundable because they have a really good street credit. So, you, know. you can lean over another space, you don't have to mention the word. I, I, I understand that. Um, so, it's, <laughs> that's, why, that's why I said to Declan, you know, have you looked at those ones? You know, yeah. there's that thing. But, uh, so, a couple of the really interesting things about, about these earthworms is, you know, what I said before, the toxic trace metals, that they're bioaccumulators, they will get in the food web that way. There's some, there's some results from the cat skills where people say, hey, I've got so much, so much mercury in my big nose thrush. These earthworms can explain that. They can, you know, they're, 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 you know, they're prey, and they basically, when they hit that peak of their population in, in the midsummer, um, they will have, as I said, will have accumulated most of, of the toxic trace metals. Not all of them, but quite a few of them uh, in, their, in their bodies. And you don't, you know, they, they may be going, they may be going down to five centimeters in, in that soil, uh, and they will. Have taken up most of those <coughs> of the So Take that is, to your friends. Is, is there like some sort of a database where you can actually construct these ecological food webs regardless of your regarding your study? Is, is I, I can't. I, I don't have. Okay. I don't. I don't know where to. Look, but okay. uh, there's people that do uh, studies on earthworms and and food webs and earthworms from a nutrient cycling point of view. So the good side of the earth. So don't look at right. the <laughs> One, two, three. Um, have you noticed any changes in other animal populations? I don't look at other animals. I'm, I'm just a, I'm just a really stupid soil scientist. <laughs> it's not true. Do you think the worms would be responsible for extirpating other species in the area or displacing other? They species? will definitely. So this particular earthworm, the Inventus agrestis, will definitely um, uh, displace European earthworm species. Uh, people have shown that. Uh, they are highly flexible in, uh, in what they feed on, so they, they, they are actually also very good competitors uh, um, for, um, for food, for other um, arthropods in, in the, the soil food web. So that, that is happening, yes. Well, there's a host of ways that that particular species could eliminate amphibians or reptiles. And first of all, it could be overwintering, the species that overwinter in the leaf litter. Mm -hmm. If you have 
No leaf there, there and die in the winter. So then sure. The winter. The, with the winter kill, there will be the food source sure. because it's like uh, red back salamanders or detritivores, they're feeding on detritivores and feeding on the leaves. And if the leaves are gone, then you would, you would assume that the red back salamanders would disappear. And they, in turn, are the food source for a host of other species. There are species like garter snakes, which are feeding directly on the earthworms. Gar snakes, decays brown snakes, uh, red belly snakes, which are, are worm and slug, especially. So, well, there's also there's also brown nesting birds that, that sure. use the cover. And, 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 <coughs> and the, the the habitat provided by the ferns is forging habitat for wood frogs and spring people. So there's just all kinds of negative impacts. Absolutely. And, and I think it's an awareness of the potential impacts of the species. I think it's a really big deal. You know? Yeah. So uh, I know with European um, programs that there's been some, some uh, evidence that suggests that they increase the success of invasive plants. Yes. So I was wondering if you also see that with. Well, every time I, I dig out an invasive plant, I find out something. So it doesn't mean that there is a causal relationship there. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you know, if, if you look at um, barberry, for example, a uh, really great invasive plant, you like barberry, right? So it's beautiful. It's just a horticultural tree. So if I look at, and I traveled back back home at some point uh, a few years back on my, my mom's birthday, and it was around about 21st of March. The barberries were getting really active here, the barberries were getting really active in Europe, exactly the same time. Regardless of the snow on the ground, barberries were doing pretty well. And uh, at this, the very same time, the earthworms, the, most of the Euro European earthworms, uh, come back to uh, become active again at the same time. So there's a nutrient flux uh, that's induced by, by these, these earthworms um, that is much more closely synchronized with those invasive plants than, than with the, the, uh, the native ones. So I mean, you, you lose, you lose, right? That's, that's historic. I can tell that to, to all of the, the nice little plants here in Vermont. You lose, you lose. You've got to be active. You've got to be there with the invasive plants. But early, early phenology uh, plants uh, seem to be in, in better synchrony. I don't really necessarily believe that earthworms facilitate that. The only reason why I think that this might happen is because the earthworms prepare the ground for, for plant invasion. So they take care of many other uh, comp uh, competing species. Uh, so, and they, the, the ground is, is more radical, so you, you, get, you get more radical plants coming with the you know, invaders. Uh, so it, there's, a, there's a good chance that that connection exists. exists. But I, I'm not 100% sure about the data that it actually shows cause causality. Um, hi, I'm Bridget. Um, I um, formerly worked at the Echo Leap Aquarium and Science Center, and we changed our um, educational approach to earthworms while Excellent. I was there. And I gotta tell you, you're okay. right, right? It, yes, exactly. So we started approaching the public about, about this, the dark side of earthworms, right? And what's really challenging is, like you said, earthworms have this great reputation. They're used in elementary schools as like a great way to start off observational skills and science skills. Um, and so, but there's all of this misinformation out there. What I did find was, um, once I connected it to some of the stuff that Jim was sharing, mm -hmm. is people get excited about that because it's something that they can really easily grab onto, they can identify, they, they know what an earthworm is, they're familiar with it, and just those great simple identification pieces that you pulled out um, make it easy for people maybe to help you get some of this data that you're interested in, like where did you see them, what were they, what setting were they in. Um, so I'm kind of hopeful, like if we can get this campaign, this, the dark side of reforms campaign going, um, then maybe we'll increase some of that awareness and be able to, to tackle some of these things. I'm trying to get reforms on the the next uh, Star Wars movie and then be on the side of the there's, there's a lot of comical <laughs> approaches. Is that a valid email address? That, that is, is that is 
No, 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 it's UPN. I'm dyslexic. My sister was more dyslexic than I, but I still have to try. <laughs> I wanted to ask, well, you said you're from England, so I... I'm not, I didn't say that. Sorry. I, I, I suspected say that. you were an accent, but I hadn't heard enough accent. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I'm from Germany, but... Uh, you okay, know, so... Yeah. Closer. Ah, it's all in the neighborhood. Yeah, it's all in the neighborhood. Until 2017, I'll be very different after that. <laughs> yes. So, how these... Earthworms kept uh, in the natural cycle in their native land. Well, they're forever. It's a really good question. Is so this, this, this earthworm is from Japan, and I talked to somebody who <coughs> has done extensive work over. Uh, he's, he's Japanese, and he, he's, he's a specialist on these worms, and he said, you know, this is this funny, this this funny notion over in America that that they're only invasive in America. You, you guys are so America centric. <laughs> they're also invasive. They're also invasive in Japan, yeah. right? So uh, only only because it's it's from a different country doesn't mean only because from a country doesn't mean it couldn't be invasive there. You know, it's like uh, um, what's a good word? Uh, cowbird, right? Cowbird. Yeah. A cowbird. Yeah. Now everybody, it's an American species, right? Yeah. North American species, <laughs> and yet there is these ornithologists that. Do this to them over here this, on, the, on, the, on the east coast because <laughs> they are displacing other birds. You know? So it's so what keeps them in, in check? Uh, they may not be kept in check. They might. They might. And in fact, be. in fact, people that I talked to recently been to Japan. They said, you know, there have been two sites that look just like like the ones here. So there's a German um, forest uh, forest ecologist who says there's only two kinds of forests in Germany. There's the ones actually I disagree, but. <laughs> I won't tell you about why I disagree, but there's two kinds of forests in, in Germany. There's the ones with earthworms and the ones without earthworms. And so you got used to the ones without earthworms. You go to the highlands of Wales, to, to the uplands of Wales, uh, you know, that's not natural. That's not natural vegetation. That's cut there by some, some Roman import, you know. Bloody <laughs> sheep and silly goats, you know, that's... So we, we, we all develop cultural values that have to do with our surroundings, you know, and so in Britain, there's the uplands, they're uh, totally denuded of forests, yeah. for the most part. Green Roman Hills, we love them, right? Right, <laughs> it's a great landscape, it's wonderful, and you know, you love, you love that landscape if you live there, but in reality, that's, that's not what's supposed to be there, and so this whole conservation <coughs> movements in, in Wales and Scotland and, and, and the Lake District, and they all kind of go, we have to conserve this, this land the way it is, you know? Uh, I don't know what your opinion on is, but... Yeah, no, it's the same in Ireland. I mean, everyone comes to Ireland for green rolling hills, but, to, you know, that's the reason they're killing their bogs, because they've already cut down on the trees. Right, let's go for it, right? So, yeah. uh, so it's, a, it's, a cultural, it's a cultural judgment, you know? Yeah. The Japanese will say, where is their native habitat? It's, it's Japan. Japan and Korea, so that's an emphasis aggressive, but they, you know, most of the most of the earthworms in Asia and that part of Asia are megas megascolescids, uh, and those are the emphasis ones. We have the uh, so they're more like the uh, the common earthworm. So um, it's difficult. So there, there are things that you can do. Uh, there's uh, certain fertilizers that will take care of them, but you really want to put them put them down because also kill fish, so, you know, what are you going to do? I mean... Yeah. I have one last question. Oh, no! Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to wrap it up with my own question, isn't that? Uh, is it still common practice to sample for these earthworms with diluted mustard on bear soil? Uh, what, the mustard works for some earthworms, but not for all. Okay. And so, uh, there's other methods, uh, the, it's the bare knuckle method, where you start digging around you. You dig a pit and you can't be the ones that, that you find. And that takes a long time. Mustard is much faster, but it's not as efficient. You can also have, you can also do what they do in uh, Godzilla. In Godzilla, the first, the first scene, right? Mm -hmm. Godzilla? Chernobyl. You stick two electrodes in the ground. Uh, yeah. And they come working out so people catch them, catch them with electric currents, uh, electric, electric fields. Uh, but somebody pointed out to me, one of the guys who developed this method actually died, and then somebody wrote, you know, said, oh, "Not surprising, this guy died so young because you know you stick stick a, you know, two electrodes in, into wet soil, 
What do you expect? <laughs> so, uh, there's that, and there's, there's, there's a whole bunch of other chemical extraction methods. Okay. Well, I want to thank all the speakers. Uh, session C is done now. So. Thank you.